So welcome to the third and final panel of Interlaced. Um, this panel is, uh, the heading for this panel is text, Textiles and Trade in um, the Medieval and Early Modern, uh, Medieval and Modern uh, Islamic World. Uh, the panel spans really from the Fatimid to the uh, Ottoman uh, Empire. Um, and uh, it will bring into conversation work on labor production taxation, on uh, rural farms, as well as thinking about technology and ethnography uh, in, um, in the Ottoman and, and, and in the, the modern periods. So it's a very wide ranging panel. I think if the theme for the, for the second panel is space, maybe the theme for this panel will be thinking about texts and textiles um, uh, uh, in concert with each other. Our, our first presenter um, is joining us uh, from all the way from across the Atlantic at uh, the University of Cambridge. We have Lorenzo Bondioli, who is a research fellow at Peterhouse College. He's a social and economic historian um, of the pre-modern Middle East, and he's working on the long durée history of capital accumulation in non-capitalist societies and his research investigates the political economy of Islamic empires, focusing in particular on the Fatimid Caliphate. So please join me in welcoming Lorenzo. Thank you for the invitation. Um, any favorable opportunity for me, I'm not a student of textile per se. That's why I'm merely here to learn from you. But in the course of my research um, on the social economic history of Egypt, I cannot escape the central idea of textiles, and I had to make textile production and consumption um, a big part of, of my work. Uh, so, to give you some context, uh, what you read for today um, is a hyper distilled version of the fourth chapter of my dissertation, which is an overall study of the political economy of Egypt in this key period of transition, 9th to 12th centuries, when the region became its own imperial core after centuries of dependency as a province of different empires. Now, what is unmistakable about this period, though it has often been overlooked, is the economic dynamism of Egypt. We see it in the countryside, where in lieu of uh, complaints about abandoned land and the fugitive peasants of the previous period, we find instead new land purchases, seasonal labor contracts, large estates forming, the introduction of new crops, sugarcane and cotton, um, and the expansion of traditional ones, flax, the most important for us today, from which linen um, is made. We see it in cities, which expand dramatically in this period. Think only of Cairo or Kahira, which is a new uh, Fatimid foundation and reaches in the span of a few um, decades, perhaps 300,000 inhabitants. The same trend is also visible in less famous provincial centers. Uh, we'll go back to some of these later. We see this in long distance trade as well, which by the 11th century linked Egypt to Al-Andalus, Tunisia and Sicily in the west, by the 12th to the Malabar coast of South India in the east. Textiles and fibers play the key role in both these commerces with rogue Egyptian flags exported to the west in massive quantities, thousands of tons per year. Um, and, west, uh, and Indian cotton textiles being imported from the east. We had the privilege of seeing some of these materials yesterday at the, at the museum. Now, of course, Egypt has some natural advantages. It was one of the most fertile and densely populated regions of the pre-industrial world, thanks to the annual Nile flood. And it sits at the bottleneck, separating the Indian Ocean from the Mediterranean, making it a natural hub for transit trade. Now, yet there is nothing unchanging about Egyptian society. And this period in particular, I would argue, was one of profound transformations. The outward markers of these transformations were symptoms that were generally um, associated with economic growth, demographic growth, urbanization, monetization, and even technical innovation. Now, in trying to find an explanation for this economic dynamism, I focus on the shifting equilibrium between three categories of social economic actors, the workers, the merchants, and the state, which in turn stand in for my three uh, key heuristics of labor, capital, and tax. So in a nutshell, my argument is that changes in the taxation system, and in particular, the shift from taxation in kind, taxation in cash, forced millions of Egyptian peasants onto the market to procure tax money. And that this in turn opened an unprecedented space for commercial capital accumulation by the merchants. 
So from a previous system in which peasants had to pay most of their taxes in kind, um, think of Egypt as the granary of Rome, right? Uh, we moved to a situation in which peasants had to pay most of their taxes in cash and therefore had to monetize their labor. The new taxation system put them at a structural disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis merchants on whom they now depended to procure such cash. This changed the equilibrium between labor and capital, determining the cascade effect, which in aggregate manifested as an overall burgeoning of the economy. Once we look closely, however, economic expansion went hand in hand with increased social certification. That is more hierarchy and more inequality. So to echo Professor Bullitt's uh, paper, a new ruling elite, in this case, the Abbasids and their successors, and their new way of going about governing turned out to be very good for business indeed. But I would argue that uh, this does not mean, at least in this case, that it turned out to be good for all sections of society as well. Now we can set all this aside. Um, I apologize for the premise, but I had to um, just show you the interpretive framework in which I fit the case of textile manufacturing as well. Now I say textile manufacturing, uh, this will come surprise, uh, as a surprise to none of you. Uh, as I tried to allow in the paper, we're dealing with very diverse range of labor regimes. So I selected three case studies that I consider emblematic of three different configurations of labor and capital, and which depend on different sources too. So you get a kind of full spectrum. Uh, so let's start with the first case, that of the Fayum in Middle Egypt. When in the second half of the ninth century, we meet a family of cloth merchants, the Banu Abdul Mumin. Their business model rested on weekly consignment by donkey train of cloth to their business associate in the capital, in Fustat. And we know this because various documents from their archive have survived. And among them, we also find contracts shedding light on how they went about procuring cloth from the weavers, which was the bottom of their business. So now we're getting to the weavers, in fact. The Banu Abdul Mumin contracted with multiple weavers to whom they advanced money against the delivery of a pre-established numbers of cloth pieces of agreed upon dimension and quality at a set date in the future. A similar relationship between weavers and merchants is well tested in early modern South Asia, where historians have shown how local merchant firsts and then agents of the British East India Company were able to bind independent weavers to their service precisely through the instrument of cash advances. So these clothiers were not simply merchants buying and selling commodities, but rather merchants cum manufacturers who initiated the production process itself through capital outlays. The advanced system meant reliable profits for the merchants, a steady stream of commodities, and stable employment for the weavers, as we just learned uh, uh, in the case of uh, modern Kashan. The trade-off that the weavers accepted was lower prices and an increased pattern of dependency upon the merchants. This is one of the sample contracts um, uh, between merchants and weavers. Now, this arrangement, uh, this is a Fayumi textile. By the way, full of mi 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 uh, mix match. This is not what the clothes produced by the weavers employed by the Banu Abdul Mumin would have looked like. I was looking for something plainer, but because of collecting habits, it's actually hard to find as plain a fabric as these weavers would have been produced. Probably undyed, probably unembroidered. So these clothiers were not simply merchants. Um, I know, sorry, uh, this, um, now, so this arrangement, the uh, advanced cash payments to weavers, closely resembles what the historiography of Western medieval Europe and early modern Europe calls the cottage industry, the flag system, or the putting out system, <laughs> as we recently heard, and which is widely regarded as a key element of European economic dynamism. Now, the, the Banu Abdul Mumin had cracked this centuries ahead of their European counterparts. I will not go you know, in any more detail, but I'll just leave you with that. Now, another aspect contributing to the profitability of capital investment in rural outwork was that merchants could draw on largely unpaid household labor, most likely unequally allotted along gendered lines. So while the Banu Abdul Mumin exclusively contracted with individual male weavers, these are the people who find the documents, the work of the latter necessarily rested upon the spinning of the flax into yarn, a process that goes unmentioned in the documents, but that was most likely performed by women in the household. This is a comparative case uh, from uh, modern France, where it's, it, um, the study shows that 10 women for each weaver are actually necessary to mm, create linen cloth. Now, with this, we leave the countryside and we move to the cities, my second case study, and in particular to two cities in the Eastern Delta, Damietta and Tignis, 
which starting from the ninth century became famous textile manufacturing centers, particularly renowned for their high-end products. Since far less documents have survived in the humid atmosphere of the Nile Delta, here I rely mainly on literary sources, geographers, and local administrators. And let's start with Ibn Haukal, who visited the city in the 970s and wrote that everything manufactured there is of linen. To impress his readers, he describes how he saw a single uh, golden piece of brocket in, in Tunis worth 200 dinars. Around the same time, Al Maktisi describes the city as a lesser Baghdad a veritable mountain of gold. In the 11th century, the traveler um, Nazari Khosrow and the market inspector in Bassam, who was the uh, market inspector of the city itself, agree in estimating the population of Tunis at 50,000. That is larger than Rome, the largest city in Western Europe at the same time. Ibn Bassam boasts of the city's great productive capacities, mentioning 150 shops specializing in garments, 100 presses, still for textiles, uh, 5,000 weaving rooms, employing 10,000 workers, not including, he says, embroiders. Now, even allowing for a certain degree of exaggeration and hyperbole, we are dealing with a skill and concentration of production, reveling, in fact, probably surpassing that of 14th century Florence. However, his glittering picture gets rather grimmer once we look at labor conditions. So the Jacobite patriarch of um, uh, Antioch Dionysius of Telmahre, who visited the city in 826, has this to say. Although Tinis has a considerable population and number, numerous churches, we have never witnessed greater distress than that of its inhabitants. When we inquired into the cause of it, they replied, our town is encompassed by water. Our work is in the manufacture of linen, which our women spin and we weave. We receive our daily wages from the cloth merchants, half a silver dinar per day, sorry, half a silver coin, Although we do not earn enough to food ourselves, when we're asked for the capitation tax, we pay five dinars a head, they beat us, imprison us, and compel us to hand over our sons and daughters as collateral. Now, note three things in particular. First, here too, a pattern of dependency upon merchants who directly finance production. Second, the same uh, gender division of labor, with women spinning uh, and men weaving, but only the wages of the male weavers get mentioned. Third, the poor labor conditions are expressly linked to heavy taxation. In this case, the heavy capitation tax, hitting what was still a majority Christian population. So this, by the way, to go back uh, to the question that was asked before, it's a textile boom you know, without <laughs> Muslim scholars, well, at least not just through the agency of Muslim scholars. So, um, Tinis's workers were effectively proletarians, isolated in a waterlogged city. Now, this is at the opposite end of the spectrum from the households of the Fayum, which most likely engaged in textile production on top of agricultural work. So for them, the main obstacle was distance from urban consumer markets, which their wares could only reach at the hands of merchants. In Tinis, instead, we're dealing with textile workers living in the immediate vicinity of a world-renowned textile market but who nonetheless had to accept the brokerage of merchants. <laughs> this pattern of dependency and the reasons behind it are well described by Naktisi. The taxes are heavy, especially at Tinis and Damietta, and on the banks of the Nile. The Copts may not weave any of their superb cloth, known by the name of Ashatawiya, unless they have a certificate stamped with the seal of the authorities. Neither may they sell it except to brokers to whom the cloth is previously contracted. The deputy of the authorities records what is sold in his register. It is then taken to someone who folds the cloth, someone who packs it in straw, and to someone who packs it in a basket, and to someone who puts it in a wrapping. At every step, a fee is charged. So we encounter here the same arrangement we have seen at work in the Fayum, whereby weavers contracted the sale of their cloth in advance to merchants and were therefore bound to specific buyers. On top of that, we encounter another considerable barrier to access to to the market, the plethora of taxes and fees that were exacted on finished textiles before they reached the point of final consumption. Which brings me to my third case study, Cairo Fustat, the Egyptian capital, in the first half of the 12th century. Now, here we once more have documents, um, although they are of a different um, kind. They are from the Cairo Geniza, a repository of 400,000 discarded papers and counting that survived in the attic of the Ben Ezra synagogue. Among these, um, we find hundreds of capitation tax receipts. This is a large uh, corpus of 12 
12th century receipts, still unpublished, on whom I worked as part of a team of four. And what we found is that the most common profession of the taxpayers was cassettes, silk worker, which in some cases the receipts specifically glossed as agir cassettes, employee silk worker. Meaning that we're not dealing with independent artisans, but are with the dependent workers of the same type we encountered in the Mita and Tinis. In the Geniza, we also have documents from the other end of the social spectrum. In particular, in the paper, I draw your attention to one specific document, a fascinating 12th century contract between two silk merchants, Abu Surur and Avraham Bar Yaakov. A document that describes how the two silk merchants bought from the state the right to collect taxes on the sale of silk in the Fustat neighborhood of Kasvasham, um, right there, the old Roman fortress of Babylon. So we're dealing with uh, attacks of the type described by Al-Makdizi for the Mirta and Tinis, one of the many fees state officials levied between the moment of production and that of sale. Except here, it is not a state official who is collecting the tax, it's rather a silk merchant, who therefore not only exercises control um, over workers as employer, but also supervises the whole silk market as tax collector. So if a kazaz, if uh, a silk worker wanted to sell their silk independently, now they would have to pay taxes to their employer first. And with this, I conclude my rapid survey. I hope you will forgive me for the many things I neglected, in particular the scant attention I paid to the materiality of the textiles, which survive in such large quantities from Egypt, uh, in particular from funerary contexts. So there is a whole work of matching to be done there. But I guess this is precisely the, the idea of this conference to bring together different expertises and approaches. What I hope you took away from uh, the paper and his talk is that between the 9th and the 12th century, Egypt experienced an impressive boom of textile manufacturing. Cloth merchants, who were not just mediators of exchange, but rather direct agents of production, accumulated large fortunes, putting in place sophisticated investment structures that closely resemble parallel ones from a much later period in Western medieval Europe. However, the condition under which textile workers operated deteriorated throughout the period. You only have to think of industrial era Manchester, or if you prefer a closer comparison to 14th century Florence, to see that there is no intrinsic contradiction between increased production, increased capital accumulation, and immiserated workers. In fact, I would argue that the worsening bargaining position of labor helps explain in no small part, the great fortune of the textile sector in this period. So al was astonished to find that Tinis's incomparable garments were made by, quote, the humblest and meanest of people. I would argue that, in fact, there is no such contradiction, and that was not surprising at all, and I leave you with this thought. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much, Lorenzo, for that. Uh for that presentation and we really look forward to talking about it more um, in the Q&A. Um, I'd like to now introduce uh, our next speaker, our next presenter, uh, Amanda Phillips. Uh, she is an associate professor of Islamic art and material culture at the University of Virginia. Um, she has held fellowships from the British Academy, the NEH, um, the Max Planck Foundation, and her first book, which was published in 2016, Everyday Luxuries, is about consumption of art and objects in Ottoman Constantinople. And uh, Amanda's second book, Sea Change, Ottoman Textiles Between the Mediterranean and the Indian Ocean, came out just last year with the University of California Press. So congratulations on that. Uh, and um, please uh, join me in welcoming Amanda. Thank you, Joe. Oh, I can take this off. It's really exciting. So um, this isn't quite the last paper, but I've been sort of, you know, I'm going toward the end. So that means I'm thinking about all the stuff that's already gone on. So I've made some changes, but don't worry, I didn't add more than like an extra 15 minutes. So, you know, here we go. Um, so um, first of all, really thank you um, for all the people who organized this. So Mika, Joe, Mona, and Atia, like, I'm gonna make a bad textile joke, like the first of many. Like I usually find myself on the fringe of other kinds of history and art history and Middle East studies. And it's so nice for, I think, maybe all of us to be in the center today, even though we're doing all kinds of different things. So the paper I sent for the conference um, has sort of a main topic, 
of how material interacts with technology in the case of two kinds of textiles. Right, right. Silk, velvet, and cotton, and then terry cloth. And so um, this is part of a chapter destined for the Cambridge uh, History of Technology. It's a co-authored chapter. And our brief from Dagmar Schaefer of the Max Planck was to address material really specifically. So my part of the chapter, you read some of it, has a narrative structure, right? It's telling a story about royal Turkish toweling woven in Manchester and how it was based maybe on Ottoman prototypes collected in the late 1840s. So this is chronological, right? And we're going from sort of the 1600s into the 19th century. And I hope I know how to do this. Um, you do not have to read all this. Part of what I'm asking this group about though is historiography, right? Textile studies are interdisciplinary. We've all been you know, beginning to talk about this right now, here we all are. But in writing this paper, it was really brought home to me, the fact that some kinds of textiles are more equal than other textiles. So writing about cotton, linen, and embroidery is really different than writing about compound luxury silk. And now part of this comes down to source type. Absolutely, right? So in the Ottoman world, I'm talking mostly about that. Silk is expensive, it generates revenue, it generates records as well. It also captures the attention of commentators talking about silk, figured silks for art historians, right? Um, we talk about style, motif as well. Compound figured silk, so that's fancy fabrics, right? Um, they're also better preserved, partly because of collecting practices better preserved than more mundane goods. By contrast, cotton, linen, also wool, more part of social economic history and when they're embroidered, right? It's part of women's history sometimes, but rarely is it radical enough, at least for my tastes. So when we come into the 19th century, and yes, I mean, this is way earlier or way later than the early Ottoman Empire, I promised, right? There's another intersection, right? And it's ethnography. And so now this has come up once already. So women in the Ottoman Empire weaving towels with loops observed by a British traveler, Henry Christie. And telling this story, he tells this story, or somebody tells this story on his behalf, maybe after his death, it is romantic. It's also somewhat Orientalist. And so when I'm sort of making this big list, this is sort of my first foray into what's often called early modern history or modern history. And I think these are concerns for that. Medieval history for most people at this conference, it's a much broader church. Things seem much more flexible in a way, in terms of topic and approach. Um, so my other question is once this type of textile structure hits Manchester, we get, instead of women on hand looms, we get talk about canny men and the bustle of Cottonopolis as well. And so more recent histories of the Industrial Revolution, right, are more balanced than earlier work, which is really laudatory about, right, the boom in textiles. So the big books of British business, right, were celebratory in town. Invention and quantity year after year. So it's this big shift between the Ottoman Empire and industrial Britain that really gave me pause. Ethnography gave me pause. Henry Christie was absolutely an ethnographer, right? Um, so this is a little bit what I'm struggling with. And I have to say, maybe this is super predictable. Maybe I'm naive to think this is somewhat interesting. I'm not sure it's worth bringing out. Um, after I sent this paper, I had a chat with my friend Fahad Bashara, my colleague at UVA, and he sort of convinced me that global history, that this is all global history and it's all cool, <laughs> right? That we can connect all of these things that probably weren't connected before, and this is a kind of global history, and that's the most useful way to sort of think about this. So again, I'm not sure how useful any of this is. So let me just spend the rest of my time telling the story of the material the technology, so, and I'm going to show some of the stuff that we're talking about. So um, that shouldn't be there. Um, for both velvet and cotton, we're talking about a way to create pile, the little tufts that come up from the surface of a fabric, and we're talking about a case where we use a continuous warp or a continuous weft. 
So this category with the continuous warp or weft does not include typical wool pile carpets where the little knots are put in by hand. So this one in particular we're seeing here in a diagram I took off the web is a velvet or terry structure that uses a second warp to make the pile. Right, so we call it a pile warp or a supplementary warp, and we're seeing a simplified sort of simplified version here. And um, what's important is the fact that we have two sets of warps, and that means we do need a draw loom, so a loom with two sets of shafts. But this is not the only type in the Eastern Mediterranean, maybe elsewhere. I'm looking now at Etsy and Sumru. Um, there is also the practice of making loops with wefts as well. So Milton Sonde, master of textile structure, noted this for linens coming out of, um, attributed to Egypt. I think he'd seen someone else's notes about this too, somebody working at the Textile Museum. I don't yeah, know. Examples, so yeah. he, has, he has worked with us, so he knows that very well. Yeah, so I rely on his analysis here, right? I haven't seen this in particular. So I'm actually kind of ignorant about how exactly this was done. Um, for later periods, we have descriptions of what, what seems like weft knitting to some extent, using needles as we work. Um, I've also, people have speculated about a comb placed right in front of the weaver that acts as a warp, right? So all the little teeth of the comb act as separate warp studs. When it's withdrawn, it le leaves the loops. But again, I speculate I haven't seen them. What we're interested in here is loops. So when we're talking about silk velvet there, we are talking about velvet made with warp loops, okay? And most of these that survive are figured, unsurprisingly, um, meaning that they have inwoven decoration. And so this is one example from a larger group of similar silk and gold textiles studied intensively by Milton Sonde um, and more recently by Michael Peter. And there are different versions of this actually that use different loom setups. So maybe woven in multiple centers, maybe we're looking at transfer of technology from Italy or Iran or now maybe northern China, I think has been brought into it. So extra warp makes the pile. And this is super efficient actually, right, especially on a draw loom, which is equipped with these two sets of shafts. So I actually think we have time, and I, I hope I can make this work. I have a little video here. Maybe I can't. Kristen, can you bail me out? Yes. Uh oh, all right. Oh, well done. <laughs> And the slicing to turn the loops into puffs in this case. Um, there's a lot to say about this. She's using the warp creel. She also, when she designed this fabric, made a mistake, and this turned out to be unsustainable in, um, because it, it, it causes huge trouble in the tensioning because she used alternate stripes of colored warp. So I'm not going to talk much more about this. What I think we want to take away from this is the force Marina is using. Okay, she's pretty strong. And she's really beating that and lifting that, and she's using this um, razor blade as well. So hard work, and also that silk has to be tucked. So when we're talking about the Ottoman Empire, oops, yay. Um, we are talking about figured velvets woven from about the 1460s, if not earlier. Um, in terms of this warp loop velvet, where is the technology transferred from? Um, you know, I, I've tried to study this. I'm totally not sure. Maybe Iran maybe Italy. So what we're looking at here is there's a magnified view. It's not a great photo. Um, you can see the tufts standing out from the ground 
of fabric. So you're looking at green warp and you see metal wrapped thread. It's often really badly tarnished. It's used to fill in the areas that don't have a pile. So there are a lot of people who've studied this stuff. Um, we often emphasize the fact that the supplementary work has to be really strong for the velvet to survive, to look good, to even be woven. And also for Italy, we know that changes in spinning technology for this kind of work seem to lead to uh, changes in textile structure between about 1350 and 1400. In the Ottoman written sources, there's also much discussion of how important it is to have a well-twisted warp. Okay. Um, even though the structure of the velvets remains really pretty consistent for quite a while. So it's the warp that makes silk velvets, silk velvets. This is the important part. And so the Ottoman city most associated with velvet weaving is Borsa. And this is all through different kinds of written sources. So we have imperial orders, priceless, Sharia court records, the educational investigation into craft practice as well. And so Borsa for silk velvet. Also, though, Bursa for people making cotton and linen textiles at the same time, but much less attested in written sources. So uh, we also have this, which I'm not going to talk about. We do have velvets in other fibers. This is wool. But Ottoman weavers are making other textile structures with pile. Okay, So there are a number of towels extant from the late 18th and 19th century that use small areas of looped pile. And I, again, I haven't seen these. Um, there are a number of curators and experts working on these. Um, there's a set at the Textile Museum, a set at the v &A, and a set at the Sadler Hanum. In many cases, people uh, have not quite said if this is warp or weft pile. I've also talked to some colleagues in Istanbul, so this is oral history stuff, who have said they have bought towels with pile from Borsa, and these date back probably to the 1880s or so. So are there surviving warp loop towels in the Ottoman Empire? Not clear. So what is clear is in all cases, they are linen, okay? So linen, flax, it is not as strong as silk, but it's much stronger than cotton. Right. It's about the length of the fiber here, the whole stem of a relatively tall plant. So what do we make of this? I mean, is there a transfer of technology between silk velvet and linen warp loop towels? Maybe. Is one much more attested than the other? Definitely. Right. So that's the crux of it. Right. And I'm going to sort of wrap up here finally. Right. Um, what we're interested in, too, is how these um, linen towels with loops woven in the Ottoman Empire were transferred into linen and cotton toweling around 1850, right? So our ethnographer, Henry Christie, observes the weaving. He's doing this in the 1840s. He purchases some samples of these as well, brings them back to Manchester, to his family farm. And this is where we get the story, right, and the complete switch in the way we think about the history of textiles. So Henry Christie samples, coupled with his observations of Ottoman women weaving in the palace, right? That's bizarre. Um, he's afraid craft practices are going to die out from competition from mass produced goods. So Christie firm, what do they make? There's the weft loops, they make towel, sorry, plush. So this is a kind of plush, it's a shaggy velvet, with less dense and longer pile, right? Um, that's what the Christie firm is making at their mills near Manchester. So Christie took his Ottoman sample to Samuel Holt. He's an engineer who is working as a supervisor in the Christie plush mills, right? And Holt then develops a machine and also a set of steps that permits work loop fabric to be used uh, to be made without the use of a wire. So not like Marina was doing, right? So within a year after this or so, um, well, within a few years, um, Christie's was weaving cotton and linen, linen towels, and they had one recognition from Queen Victoria, right, at the 1851 Great Exhibition. So what do we make of this, right? I mean, we sort of get at the fact that in these sort of discussions of Manchester, of men's work, 
Poppin, that it's about ingenuity and it's about prosperity as well. Quantity, certainly. Um, and we get that with Samuel Holt, the engineer, and we get him eventually being lured to the United States, to Patterson, New Jersey, where he is asked to set up velvet weaving again. So a switch back, right? And so what are we talking about when we talk about this boom? What's missing from it? We've always thought about the history of the Industrial Revolution as sort of Manchester in this nest of cottage industries that are British. Maybe we can complicate the story slightly, but if we do that, what exactly is our link? Is there a transfer of technology? Is it meaningful? Or are we just reifying this idea that in Manchester, we take what is handicraft, wherever it's from, and turn it into prosperity and mass production, leaving out, of course, the misery of the mill workers for the most part. And to come back finally to material, right? The paper goes on to point out, right? It's changing and spinning of cotton that allows cotton material to be used to make those loops. Cotton is otherwise fragile. So new ways of spinning cotton, turning it into really good thread, which then drives demand for cotton, which directly implicates the United States and where the mills in Manchester were getting their cotton. So material comes back, it is changes in material that allow this to some extent, and then how that in turn drives the production of that kind of material. So not in Iran or Egypt, but in Georgia, Louisiana, et cetera. So I leave it there totally. I'm sure that was more than enough. So thank you for your patience. <laughs> okay, so um, I'd like to welcome our, our third and our final presenter for the day before we, um, open this up for Q&A and some final reflections. Um, Sumer Krodi is senior curator of uh, our very own GW Textile Museum. Uh, she, um, uh, uh, she is editor-in-chief of the Textile Museum Journal. Uh, born in Izmir, Turkey, Krodi specializes in textiles from the late antique era and the Islamic world. She has curated or co-curated 13 exhibitions uh, maybe more at this point <laughs> since his biography was written. Uh, she has authored or co-authored uh, seven exhibition related publications along with numerous articles and book chapters. So please join me in, in welcoming Sumer Cody. Um, thank you. Um, and thank you for reminding me. Uh, my task for today is um, really talk about the Texan Museum's collection and especially from a period that you have been covering um, early Islamic material. Um, that is part of our collection and it's uh, 850 strong uh, textiles we have. And, but more importantly, I want to focus on under two, about 250 of those which are from um, period starting 9th century goes on until the 18th, 18th century, and it is identified as coming from India and found in Egypt in Fustat. So um, I kind of narrowed it down. I promise I won't be showing all 250 pieces, but a selection of it and um, several ways you can look at it. This is basically share with you um, also let your appetite and your students uh, this, to this collection and possibilities up for research for this collection. We always appreciate that. Um, in short, the, the, the collection is actually put together, acquired by the founder of the museum, this gentleman, George Witt Myers. He began collecting this material in late uh, 1920s. But bulk of this 250 pieces came between 1930 and 31. So it's a very short period of time he collected. And his collecting generally was through dealers. And Tano and Abamaya were his big um, dealers for this material. So what I would like to do is not do an exhaustive survey, rather, like I said, with your appetite and give you some ideas about what kind of 
uh, material is in the collection. So this 250 textiles that said to be from Fustat, only 180 of them are resist and modern dyed fabrics that are from um, India. Most of them are from India with few exceptions. The rest of, there are several different types of those materials, which I will show later. And uh, what you see on the screen is one of the early ones, ninth and or 10th century. And you can see it's a very Hellenized um, uh, uh, imagery on it. There's the arcade at the bottom uh, with these dancing figures um, and maybe their scarves are glowing behind them. This is a very kind of late Roman imagery. And above it in the register, you see three people, two women and in the center are men and he has a trident. So this being from India, he is thought to be Shua, but you can interpret it in different ways as well. So let's start with that. The next group I'd like to share with you, as I said, the material really allows you to look at it in from different perspectives. Um, um, one way to engage with this collection is looking technologically how the dyeing is done. And as you know, Indians were the masters of <laughs> resist dyeing and still they are. And this too, I put it down as you can see, one is simple red with the uh, design on um, the color of the fabric itself, original fabric, the other is all blue. And they go through two different dyeing processes to become what they are. One, the red one is basically you know, wax is introduced, resist is introduced uh, through blocks, and then the piece is dyed, um, dipped into alum, it's a mordant, and then dipped into a dye, which is most likely matter in this case from its color. And then you get, to, you get the red color. But the other is you resist it and then dip it in the blue dye and get uh, indigo is totally without a, needing a mordant dyes the textile. So that's kind of looking at this is a one way. And we have a large group of just red and just blue one, as well as multiple color ones. This one is two color, uh, three color, but the way they are done is what's interesting technologically about this is they use two mordant and one color to create this three colors. So, um, and you can also see the size of the block they use for it. So when you start looking at this material, um, uh, you definitely kind of develop an eye for it. And above and beyond also, we have a very colorful ones and they see a totally different, I mean, similar, but multiple processes to achieve this type of coloration. That's kind of one way looking at this material. The other is you can just look at the designs and create a design history for this material. This is one of the, again, early ones, um, uh, probably ninth century, maybe even earlier. What's interesting, I, by the way, this is also on exhibition right now in our galleries. If you have time, go to check it out. Um, and of course, here is a quite large looking piece, but it's actually, it's small. Um, and what's interesting about it is you can see the imagery on it also much earlier um, Gupta period material as well. This is another group that's another way of looking at it. These you see little goose hamster design on it. What's interesting about it is um, the same imagery also shows up um, what is survived from Southeast Asian textiles as well. And you kind of understand that the textiles coming off from this part of India was not only destined for the Islamic markets in Egypt, but also Southeast Asia as well. So that is another study, you know, what were the trade routes for this material. This Hamse or goose motif is also goes back very early. You see sixth century um, Ajanta paintings. Uh, he's wearing right there in his wrap, um, you see the goose. 
and even giant manuscripts later on, you see the, uh, the same motif popping up as well. So that's one group. The other group is the ones which has inscriptions on them. Um, these two one is 10 to the other 15th century. So we can do a, quite a study of inscribed textiles. Here's a couple of others. The one on the right um, is much, much later than the one other, so 13th and 18th century. And you can start seeing the more, more Mughal influence, the one on the right. Um, inscribed ones, among the inscribed ones, there were also locally produced ones coming from Fustad as well. This is one example. This is uh, Mamluk material, probably done in Egypt. We don't know for sure. But um, you can see the inscription is basically, you can see similar treatment aesthetic in the metal uh, material from Mamluk production as well. This is also interesting technically because you can really easily see the block. We have the and finish on one side, so you can really identify the block so that you can do the technical study as well. So this is a very nice one. So another group we have in the collection is the figurative ones. And the figurative ones, the figures generally um, uh, align drawings relate to the Western Indian folk art. And you can see from here, there's a, um, there's a warrior on the left with a straight sword, and then there's another one with the bow pulling a bow. So this is some kind of a, um, a battle scene. It, it, the red on it is a later kind of stain, but the rest of it is all blue, uh, actually. And this is another figurative one um, from the collection that um, I come to study. And this is, again, um, someone on horse, a female warrior, and with the creature with the elephant head and lion body and a dog attacking a boar. So, I don't know if you can see that there, but um, that's what's happening. And these are generally, as I said, very um, small fragments. So I really encourage you to go take a look at it in the museum's um, exhibition. This piece I like the most, so that's why I put it on my, um, opening um, slide. The reason I like is it reminds me of the material I enjoy studying coming from more Western Asia, Sasanian material with pearl roundels and birds with uh, jewels on their beaks. And you can see that that's exactly what he has on his uh, mouth. Um, another group is this one. This is another very interesting group because again, fragments from Southeast Asia as well uh, relates to this material. And actually, if you go to the exhibition in the museum, you will find a hip wrapper from Southeast Asia with this design. Uh, but these are you know, from Egypt. And one thing about the collection is, this is how Myers collected. Um, he loved buying multiples, so he can allow people to do comparative study. So that's why this collection is important in that sense. He loved beautiful things, but he also well, wanted to buy multiples just so you can do comparative studies. Um, so that we have lots of these kind of large collections. When you see one museum has one, we have 10 of the same material. Anyway, this, like this one, this group is also very close relationship with the South Asian. Um, uh, what's sold to South Asia, um, Southeast Asia as well. Another group which I very much enjoy uh, in working with is this group. What's interesting about is it is imitating another more expensive textile. Um, it is block printed, but what is imitating is tie dye which is a more time consuming if they're both resist dye, but in a different way. And um, this group is also um, uh, of interest. I'm interested in how one type of textile is also imitated in other ones. So this is this group is a really uh, uh, interest to me. 
Then we also have a later period examples. This you can obviously see the Mughal influences on this resist dye material. And here is a couple others. Now, this is for Amanda. <laughs> we also have from this group textiles, which we are pretty sure produced not in India, but in Eastern Mediterranean. And this is one group, and this is definitely, if not early 17th century, late 16th century Ottoman piece. You can see the, from the carnations, you can see the, from the chintamani, you can see the tulips, the way tulips are represented. This is a very Ottoman piece. Um, Again, they're small fragments, but they are really important because you don't have any of this material from this early, from the Ottoman and being cut in uh, uh, material. Fustan material is not only just resist dyed and modern dyed material. Um, the collection has all the small amount other material from Fustat, uh, but not that type. And one on the right, far right, is a compound leaf wool compound leaf. And the one in the center is from Yemen. It's a Yemeni cut there of 10th century, one on the right 12, but I think it's even earlier than that. So um, all the small, they, there is a variety in that group as well. So it's kind of the introduction to the collection. Now, the next thing I would like to share with you, how you can get your hands on these material, <laughs> materials. We have uh, four research centers. Um, um, two, three of them is for primary research and one of them for secondary research. Um, and you can get to them with this website. Um, you see it here and you click on the research center and you can get, um, hold on and explore more what they are, what they are not. But in brief, two of them is in Fodibari in this uh, campus. One is uh, Arthur, Arthur D. Jenkins Library of Textile Arts, and that is the library established with the Textile Museum in 1925. And Myers, besides being textile collector, he was a bibliophile, so we have some rare books going back um, really deep. And we have as much books as we have textiles, which is about 21,000 uh, objects and 21,000 books. The second is Coatesland Textile Traces Study Center. I know some of you were with us uh, yesterday. We had a little tour of it, but that is an on-site resource for if you want to study this material. The interesting thing is these two collections are online, fully online. So you can find it. Actually, you can get to the textile, uh, Arthur D. Jenkins Library through Gallman Libraries. Um, website. And for uh, the Kutz and collection, just go to the website and you will have access uh, to the collection. And I put the little websites uh, for that. But the collection I was just sharing with you is actually in, in the George Washington University Science and Technology Campus in Ashburn, Virginia, textile museums. That collection has full examples, not only a fragments like the traces and all of the textile museum's collection, unless they are on view in an exhibition here, is stored there. Uh, one reason is that has more space for storage of this. And there's also space for us to kind of spread and do the comparative study we, uh, we like to do uh, with this material. And we hold classes there as well. Um, so um, anytime you want to kind of get um, get access to this collection, please let me know. We are putting our textile museum's collection online. It's a slow process because we have so many pieces, but, um, and sometimes what happens is you see the tip of the iceberg, there's a bigger collection. You, they may put two, three pieces up, but we have a larger collection. So for the textile museum's collection, it's always safer to come to the curators and then what tell them what their your research area is, and we can help you to get to hold on to the collection. And then I uh, welcome to come and look at it as well. So with that, thank you very much. I think for the Zoom, the Zoom audience, I, I think actually um, I was so distracted, I forgot to introduce myself uh, after lunch. I'm Joel 
Blecker. I um, teach uh, and research Islamic history at GW uh, in their history department. Uh, and again, you know, it's been said many times, but, you know, once yet again, you know, I'd like to thank uh, Shana and uh, Mona and um, Christian for all the support and as well as my colleagues, um, Atiyah Ahmad and uh, Mika Natif in, in, in helping to, uh, in helping to um, uh, weave this, this, uh, this conference together. <laughs> so, um, can we do a clap? <laughs> <laughs> So this, uh, this, I, I, I was able to kind of tease out three major themes uh, from these, uh, these three presentations, which I think also echo many of the same themes we've been discussing all day long. And I think um, it's, it's, you know, it's good since this is the final panel, not just directing questions uh, to the specific papers and presentations, but also thinking more broadly about some of the big picture takeaways uh, from this, this conference and, um, what we what we've been able to cover and what we haven't been able to cover as well. Um, so maybe the first big theme, of course, is this idea of transregional trade. Um, all three presentations you know, try to engage this uh, this this uh, this textile trade, which really connected the Mediterranean through the Indian Ocean. Um, and as Sumeru's presentation, actually both, you know, Sumeru and um, and Amanda's presentation took us quite far, I mean, all the way from Manchester to Southeast Asia. So uh, we're really thinking about global trade and um, you know, thinking about the way in which textiles are connecting uh, this world, both uh, this pre-modern world, this early modern world, uh, and uh, the, the modern world that Amanda's writing about as well. Uh, the second big theme I think that has been bubbling under the surface is, um, I think, you know, something that, um, you know, the, the way Amanda phrased it was the, the misery of the mill workers. And Lorenzo, the way he, he talked about it was this invisible labor uh, with the way women were um, spinners, right? The, the kind of the labor that they were doing, uh, but also, the kind of the, the misery of the tax collector coming around, right, too. Um, and I think this is something that many of the panels today have been, um, have been trying to think about uh, kind of a, a history from below uh, and thinking, especially because textile museums tend to collect the elite, these kind of these gorgeous figural uh, representations uh, to try to think about um, not just some of the the, the, the planar cloths, the everyday um, textiles, but also to think about, um, to, think, to think about uh, the, 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 the peoples who were involved in this labor um, and uh, that, uh, that don't make it into, that don't necessarily make it into the elite um, court chronicles um, or in the illustrated manuscripts. Um, and I think, you know, maybe on that issue, you know, I, maybe one thing to, that we can think about more is, you know, so much, so much a part of the story of the textile trade and cotton trade in Atlantic studies is tied up with the history of slavery, might be worth asking us as well, where the institution of slavery fits in uh, to our story about textiles uh, and, and the Middle East. Um, and, the ways in which, uh, the ways in which the, the institution of slavery and slave people at, at various levels, statuses, um, uh, were uh, uh, were integrated into the production of textiles, the shipment of textiles, and their consumption as well. And then I think the last big point um, was maybe maybe it's the most academic one but it's the one that inspired me <laughs> to, to try to put this panel together. And that's, you know, this juxtaposition between texts and textiles. Uh, thinking about textiles as texts, uh, as, as uh, Atiyah said earlier, kind of thinking about the textiles as a kind of archive. Um, and, um, but I think, um, you know, 
the way in which textiles, we think about their textiles consumption, we think about their visual consumption, right? We think about their, how they feel, their kind of the, the, the kind of tangible, the, the kind of the sense, that, that kind of sensibility, that way of experiencing textiles, the, the softness of velvet, the, uh, in, in Ron's paper, the bewildering curiosity of the eye, you know, that, that kind of visual um, stimulation. Uh, and yet so much of the work on this panel and the work uh, of, of all of these presenters has really been about the, the way in which textiles are textualized, the way in which they can, uh, they can be represented in text, in textual form, and the way in which they appear and are represented in textual forms. Um, not just in documentary sources like Lorenzo's, I mean, these amazing receipts, right? You can actually see these handwritten receipts, um, but also um, in ethnographic sources, you know, as Amanda's talking about that, in, in some ways, the, um, this kind of transformation that Amanda's talking about, um, right, from the Ottomans to the English, to Manchester, required this intermediate textual, this intermediate textualization, this kind of the, the mediation of, a, of an ethnographic text um, to help facilitate that transformation. So um, I guess maybe it's, maybe it's, a, as I say, it's academic, you know, maybe it's a bit meta to kind of think about um, this, what is this relationship between text and textiles? How is it that, that textiles, um, you know, gener are so generative of text and this apparatus of text. And, um, and um, I think that's, again, a very, oh, and meant to be a very open um, and generative question, not one with a, um, necessarily with a, a brief answer, but maybe one for us to think about further. So um, that having been said, uh, I guess those aren't exactly specific questions, but maybe we could hear Lorenzo and Amanda in some room briefly respond uh, to, the, to those kinds of reflections. And then if there are any questions on the Zoom, please put them into the chat. And then we can open it up for, um, for Q&A in, um, uh, in our, our insight, <laughs> our physical audience. I'll say something quickly about first textiles and text, but I'm just going to actually pose a question that maybe everybody will pick up later. And then after the rest of the so, I mean, textiles and text, like, so, right, it, I think it's um, Sargent when he wrote his history of Islamic textiles before the Mongol conquest. He sort of prefaces those long articles by saying, I meant to write a history of craft before the Mongol conquest, but actually I found so many references to textiles, I had to confine myself. Right. So there you have it. Right. And, and, you know, I think people are, you know, historically, in some cases in the Islamic world, a little later than our period, right, a health of an economy. It's not measured by your manuscript producing workshops or even necessarily, I don't know, merchants. It's, it's measured by the health of your textile sector. So it's a big deal. Um, and it is everywhere. But sometimes we seem to be only talking about the one or two percent that are really, you know, sort of drifting along the path. In terms of text and textiles, I mean, Textiles generate text, but so the, this is my question really as sort of um, somebody who maybe doesn't always do such a great job with the texts, but really likes the textiles. And my question would be, what can extant objects, if we have them, tell us that texts do not? How can they contradict texts mm -hmm. in some cases? So that's sort of an open question. Okay. Well, following on that, one thing about looking at this, this could be kind of um, transferred to any other media as well. But when you look at the textiles, especially what I would want to focus on, for example, Tura's material, because they have text on them. So that, that were for both directions. But that material, I think, besides what it says on it, the materiality of it is also gives you a clue. Sometimes the text on it may mislead you if you don't look at the material. That's true for the design because design is tends to be very easy to copy. 
but the materiality is not. If somebody knows how to do, you know, spin it or weave something to a certain way, that's really ingrained. You have a muscle memory, but design, you don't. <laughs> so you can be weaving same design in Central Asia, you can be weaving in North Africa. Unless you know how to look at the material, they may look the same. So for me, really understanding materiality as well as the design goes hand in hand together <coughs> to be able to read there. And I'm sure you can say that for you know, ceramics, the glass and things like that. The antique glass is for me is much more because it does have many layers into the uh, production of it. It's just not the, only the fibers, but the, how the fiber is spun how thick is it, how often is it, what type of weave structure they selected. To, I mean, archeological material, you can only say about weave structure, not the technology so much. You can infer the technology from the structure, but you know, you don't have the loom surviving from the period. So uh, for me, it's just they go hand in hand. I don't know if it's so. So that is still much closer than the text alone brings you. Like with, with all the fact that in Egypt you have these incredibly kind of quotidian everyday life documents, but still you don't get to the actual moment of the material process. And so I, I have no way of imagining any of the actual actions of living spinning, any of the material and human moments of that, even with this extremely close to the moment of production documents. Yeah. I mean, right? It's, I mean, that's the other thing, right? I mean, textiles are hard. Right? It is hard to train to learn yeah. how to recognize these things. It's hard to put together these ideas. I mean, I'll, I'll leave that aside. And also, I mean, there are other parts to other questions that people might want to answer. Yes, Richard. Yeah. I, question for Lorenzo. Um, I find your work seems quite fascinating. I really appreciate the talk. I liked all the talks. Um, but I, I, I think that we have not paid enough attention to brokers. And I'm so happy you talked about that because I think that uh, there is in Middle Eastern Islamic society a continuous propensity to have values set by brokers rather than set by the market. Uh, it isn't that you have a open buying and selling, it's that you go to someone and that person uh, knows a price and sets a price. I, I recently was reading uh, Ashraf Ghani's doctoral dissertation on Afghanistan. And he has a, it's an excellent piece of uh, anthropological work. And he explains how the brokers would come to the village and determine the price for whatever the village is producing, the grain or the chickpeas or something. And then that would be delivered to them and they would carry up. And uh, uh, again and again, uh, I'm, I'm interested in how um, occupational surnames or occupational epithets uh, vary from society to society. And they often tell you uh, whether something is of a higher or a lower importance. So that I don't know of a, of a surname in European languages that means broker, um, but Dalal in Arabic is fairly common, and that's a broker. Um, uh, similarly, um, in, uh, in European languages, one of the most common surnames, uh, let's say the two most common surnames in a sense are uh, Miller and Smith. But if you look at Middle Eastern surnames, there are no Millers, because that whole level of society where the Miller was the richest person in the village um, and I guess surname, that doesn't carry over into the middle, in the middle East, you, you really don't have Miller's emerging, uh, but they have in Europe. So I think there's something about brokerage um, and the importance of brokers that's important here. And I'm, I have a suspicion that it may have to do with the fact that for say two, two to 300 years, between the people who were actually doing stuff and the people who were uh, in a position to buy stuff, 
you had a religious difference. And that, um, you know, to have some kind of equity between uh, a Muslim stratum that were buying and, uh, and consuming stuff and a producer stratum made of people who were uh, perhaps not Muslims um, yet. Um, whether the notion of, uh, of having, uh, of setting prices to brokers was a, um, came into being there. There's a, a there's a passage in a, a book on a Sharia, I can't remember exact passage now, dealing with um, peasants uh, selling food to Baghdad, where they were producing foodstuffs in the countryside, and um, and they were supposed to be, be represented in their uh, in their uh, selling of this food uh, into Baghdad, and, and I think that the uh, so it may connect with a religious difference. It also may connect with a very, very different transportation system overland than you had in, in Europe, where you, you had no ox carts. Uh, you, no farmer had a vehicle by which to get stuff to a market. And no one had a camel because you didn't keep camels uh, on your farm, just one to go in the market with. Instead, you sold stuff to a broker. Then the broker brought the camels because the broker had a relationship with camel breeders so to, to rent some animals. And so I think that the transportation, the absence of, of uh, cheap wheeled uh, tra traffic and ox carts um, on the one hand and a religious difference on the other uh, made the, uh, the notion of having um, Millmen set prices. Uh, it may have made them uh, in a stronger proclivity to that. I, in Nishapur in 1966, I bought a bicycle to ride around the ruins in. And uh, the man I was renting a room from, an uh, English teacher in high school, said he'd buy the bicycle. And I was done. So I got to the end of my stay there. And I said, OK, you want to buy the bicycle? And um, he said, yes go into town and talk to so-and-so and he will set the price because he's the broker. Uh, and so I went to this bicycle shop and I said, well, uh, Mr. Fosnell says you should set the price for this used bicycle. And he said, okay, it's, uh, it's 10 tomans. And I went back home and I said, uh, I went there and he said, 10 tomans. He said, oh, did you try and talk him down? I said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm the seller. <laughs> um, you told me, you, told, you picked the broker. I went, he gave me a price, and you expected uh, me to talk him down. So, oh, you, you misunderstand. We'll go together. So I went back to the shop, and uh, the guy um, by post said, um, I was selling, you know, what's the price? And I said, 10 tow bands. And so then, Mr. Fazel turns me. He says he says eight tomans. I said, no, he doesn't. He said, Ten tomans. Oh, you understood Persian. I did this after living with him for weeks. But but, uh, but the idea that uh, that you would uh, when you have differences between buyer and seller, um, you would go to to a broker. It, there's just something very different from European culture in that. I think. I have a somewhat articulated answer to that, so I don't know if maybe we should <laughs> maybe leave it for later or... I mean, I think there's definitely a lot to the question of brokerage. What I was trying to say, however, is that all these Valdalun and Samasia, they're not just brokers, and they're just not, not just the guy who sets the price of the price, but like, that same guy... They facilitate. Not just that. Like, if, if that same guy who had the worship where you can set the price of your bicycle, if that guy actually put out bicycle pieces, 20 workers to make bicycles and pay them five tolmans per week to give them bicycles, he would still be at that land because that's kind of his profession. Right. But in Europe, like in Western European historiography, he would be called a manufacturer. So I'm, what I'm trying to say is that I'm sure brokerage is incredibly important and I agree that it has to do with cultural differences. There is definitely a question of brokerage when European traders arrive in the harbors of Egypt, they have to go through a broker to do purchases and so on and so forth. 
In Egypt, I'm not entirely sure if the religious difference was always that marked. I have Jewish merchants buying from Christian weavers or from Muslim weavers. The, the merchants in Tunisia are probably majority Christian until quite late. Some of them probably must. I don't know. I think Egypt is a very complicated, I don't know how, how much one can generalize, but for sure there, there is plenty of brokerage. I think there's also a lot of um, various ways in which the three Abrahamic religions are arranged in the hierarchy of brokerage. Um, so yeah, I, I agree, but I also think that there is a risk of getting trapped in semantics. So the Middle East gets the brokers and Europe gets the manufacturers. Well, my brokers, the brokers I study, do what the European manufacturers <laughs> do. Um, the why is the cottage industry an industry? And theirs is also, it's only mediation. While the structure is actually the same. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Very interesting. <laughs> the interesting exchange. Pick up that idea of a factor yeah. as well. <laughs> Right? I mean, factor, that's where we get made factor. factor being factor. the word, right? I mean, I've done a bunch of research now, and this can link to sort of the slavery piece, right? But the Christie firm was, so these cotton towel manufacturers were buying their cotton in New Orleans. And they took great pride. I mean, where was that coming from? This is enslaved labor on a huge, right, terrible scale. Um, they were, took great pride in the fact they didn't go through a broker. They didn't go through the Liverpool markets, just where the cotton came in. They went directly to the source. And you want to talk about religious difference, right? I mean, people frame enslaved labor like that, certainly. But if also the Christies were, this is shocking, Quakers. They were great philanthropists around Manchester, but that did not extend, apparently, anywhere. Interesting. Yes. Just to comment, this isn't something that I think about on the first person the bottom line, but uh, it just brought something interesting to mind, uh, which is the frequency of using uh, terminology, and sometimes when it's not, when, for instance, like, you know, uh, there's a good chance that in this conversation, it's not like Anat or uh, Hammam, so these words are like, you know, getting very common, of course, in the street, like here in the U.S., if you say, so nobody, there's a chance that nobody knows what we're talking about in sort of this context, knows where everybody understands those, but again, when we also want to say Dallal, then we have to say broker. So I think the more we use these words in your own context, when when it did become like more common, that's actually um, helps a lot for the conversation because then we don't say we don't need to say like broker because that's the whole like language that happens. But if we say like that a lot and everyone say yeah, you know what you're talking about, it actually it, it really facilitates uh, the whole conversation. And of course, you know if you want to do how 100 percent, it's just you should completely switch to another language. Like this. Like, you should like, switch to 100 percent Arabic or Farsi. But there is like a middle ground. Which we use like a lot of these, like a ton of these terminologies. Like those, the, the, the two things I mentioned, they're like architectural elements, right? Or like mosques or like madrasa. Madrasa, for instance, we don't say schools. We say madrasa because when we say school, it has another meaning in our head. Um, so the more we have these words uh, uh, added to our uh, sort of dictionary, like, you know, every day, like the field, that person. People, uh, it's uh, like you know, sort of uh, individuals. I think the more uh, we get closer to like uh, smoothen the sort of the conversation, uh, it, like like Dalal was like a very good like the, the conversation happened like broker Dalal was like a very interesting like I, I, like um, example. That would say Dalal also though probably as a category encompasses a ton of different things. Mm -hmm. So at some point we're going to have to define those terms. Dalal and in the year 1000 is going to look really different than Dalal in 1300. That also so, true. you know, great. But also, I mean, who, and I think it was Ron's paper. I was looking at all the terminology. All those words are also used in Ottoman Turkish and they mean totally different things. True. I mean, so in, in a context, I mean, when he says Dalal, we know that, you know, he's uh, Dalal, like, you know, that time, that place. And then if, if people just click, it clicks. But in English, it's it kind of radically different. And even, radical. even, in that time, even at that time and place, you also said simsar. Yeah. Simsar and Dalal are supposed to be synonyms, but I don't know whether they're synonyms or not. I find them both and I wonder actually. In yeah. Farsi today, they are very different today. Yeah. Or like 100%. We have well. both words that are like 100%. Different. Well, what's the difference today yeah. in simsar? Simsar, simsar is the person today, yeah. and Yuan is the person who actually uh, buys and sells uh, second hand stuff. But Dalal is very close to the broker. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. a higher level. Not different levels, the, the, different professions. Like, uh, but that love is like 
the, the, I mean, Sam Sari is like a person who technically sells furniture, like secondhand furniture. That lot is like in the market, but totally different level. Yeah, there, there is a change. I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert, but I only know from the textiles as well. Um, there is, you have to be really careful what you are saying to identify every different textiles. And the hardest part for textile studies is when you read the text, there's a term for a textiles, but we have no clue what that textile <laughs> they're talking about. And if you want to try to, I mean, some of the words we are using today still for textiles, but is it the same textile in the 10th century from the 20th century or 19th century? I don't know. I know 19th century better than. Sure. So what I'm saying is that the more we yeah. actually no, I agree with you. include these, like define you know, or see, you know, Lorenzo says like, okay, you know, that lot in this time and context mm -hmm. means this. It helps us to map it. So yeah, we exactly. add like okay, that long, that that, long, that but it definitely is very different from broker. That's what I'm saying. Like, I mean, I would pick that one rather than broker because in a way that we were talking, like you know, that might be like closer to like the context even today, like 20, 21st century you are, that download is called a broker, if it makes sense. Sometimes sometimes not. So what I was what I don't want to say like we have to like you know just use them, but what I was trying to say was that you know including these terminologies, I just like hamma or you know these things, they really facilitate to you know we don't say aqueducts, we don't say like bath, bath, bath houses. Um, so we use like we use these and of course a um, a hammam in like 19th century Iran is like architecturally very different from like you know Ottoman hammam. They're like, they're really different, but they have like you know overlaps as well. So really, I understand like the different context, but sometimes the terminology really help. And yeah. very quickly about the textiles, uh, for instance, you know I study like I, I just started like working on like terminologies um, uh, besides <laughs> what I do, and uh, textiles is the one game and just fashion, right? So we have a lot of these 19th century like Iranian even like ones, and we call all of them jackets. But in text, when you read those, they're not like not they have different names. They have some of them are sadari, some of them. Are, so we, we can actually start like working on the terminology and make like you know a little more precise in our conversations. And when they get common, this actually I think is success because it facilitates like conversations. Okay. All right. I'm gonna bring Ron in. Just a note on, on related things. So this semester I've been teaching a course in, that I titled uh, Jews of the Muslim East. And we, we do a lot of work also with professions that are supposedly Jewish or the Jews engage in. And we also dealt with some materials from the Afghan visa, so parallel to the Cairo visa, although much, much smaller. And maybe that doesn't venture into so many different realms. But but um, on the one hand, when you come to family names, so sometimes you would have family names that indicate profession, although it doesn't necessarily mean that all the people who carry the family name actually engaged in that profession, regardless of whether they are a job or a merchant or something else. At some point, Jews become uh, relegated to a certain extent or given or, or somehow they find themselves in very distinct professions, uh, like cloth dyeing creating or you know, basically, and especially glue um, and dyeing all the, all the cloth for the consumption of practically everybody who, who wears these stuff, this stuff, especially in Central Asia, but also in parts of Khorasan uh, to a certain extent, depending on the period. And it's interesting that in the local parlance, um, they didn't call the, you know, they would say to each other, you know, an expression like, you go to the Jew. To go to the Jew meant to essentially deliver cloth to the Jews so they can dye it. So then it's something that you can wear or use and so on. So in local parlance, doesn't even talk about a profession. You know, what are you doing tomorrow? Oh, I have to go to the Jew. And everybody understands that this is what you're doing. You're delivering cloth that's dyed blue. But on the other hand, you know, look at the source without context, then it, it becomes completely meaningless. Yeah. And that could be only that period, let's say 19th century. Well, 
Of course. Okay, that may mean, have been it, something it, else it in the differs 18th. in periods. It depends on, you know, where you are, whether you're in Kashan in, you know, in the 14th century. It could be different story. Okay. okay. So, uh, Aaron, um, I'm going to bring Aaron in. Yeah, just yeah. a brief comment that ties into what we've been talking about. I mean, it's the same with when we are trying to figure out what a textile is and we say, well, it's named after this place, which was famous to, I mean, we all know this, right? Like, um, like, oh, like satin is supposed to come from Zaytun, from Trenjo, right? Which actually I think it is, but um, in that case, <laughs> but like, you know, I think like for Damask, Damascus, things like, like it's just, it's, it's useful and it's, I think, important to like nod to that, but it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily definitive and certainly not like definitive forever, right? Like, even if it, made sense in the 11th century, maybe it didn't make sense in the 14th century. And I think like all these things, like the names of the, like like these, these names given to people, the names given to cloth, when it's named after a place or like a type of person or the type of person that did it, it's like, makes it really tricky. I mean, we all know this, but just to, just to throw that out there also. Yeah. The challenge is to, among ourselves, is easy to communicate that when it goes beyond us and you know i deal with the public you have to be really careful what you're saying to them because it's like a, they don't have the context but i'm thinking on the back of my mind when i say that term and and i never have the enough time to explain in a long or a short trip so you have to be you know beyond the colleagues you have to be really careful using those terms i, I find that to be a challenging thing. So we've, we've talked about, um, I mean, we've covered so much. Uh, we've talked about um, these uh, gender identities, the way in which gender performances, as, as uh, Mika, you know, in her first panel, we're talking a little bit of religious identities as well. Um, I'm, I, I'm reminded of, a, of an anecdote that I, um, Again, like oh, on this this first project on these hadith commentary sessions, when a um, a Persianate scholar was 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 claiming to kind of expound on Bukhari during Ramadan in in, um, in Cairo in, uh, in in the early 1400s, he was made fun of because he spoke with a lisp and a certain kind of accent, and and you know he was denigrated by some of his colleagues in Egypt for his training. But one thing that they really made sure to point out was the fact that he wore a certain kind of hat, <laughs> the tassels <laughs> that drooped down, you know, hanging down to the left in, in a certain way. And, and uh, it was his, like the, his, the kind of the performance of the fashion, you know, what, what an authority is supposed to look like uh, and um, in, within the, the, the scholarly scene. So, um, you know, it, it does strike me, you know, that this is another, uh, Area that we've just been scratching the surface of and, and thinking about the way in which textiles are um, are not just mediating, you know, um, these commercial relationships uh, or this, these long distance trade relationships, but are also mediating mediating all of these different kinds of identities, um, gender and um, uh, uh, ethnicity or ancestry or uh, even race. We haven't. Have not uh, we haven't we haven't really brought up uh, identity yeah. yeah so this is uh, this is another um, I think maybe we need to have another conference uh, because we're reaching uh, we're we're reaching our, our end of time so one of the things I've always wished somebody would study is the abandonment of headdress for men in the twentieth century. We spend a thousand years and more <laughs> just identifying people by what is on their head. But in Arabia, they still wear the headdress. Yes, that's true. And, but the, the course of abandoning uh, head coverings for men just strikes me as so bizarre. Yeah, but to your point, this maybe this text and textile issue yeah. is that um, those kind of practices are, and we, we had this issue when we did the interior show are ephemeral yeah. mm -hmm. and those are not really going to be marked down in Geniza documents or in textual sources that are about production right. or their values right. 
So a lot of that is a very uh, imaginative exercise on the one hand, and you know, looking at you know, the, the, or working with archaeological material, that is a kind of evidence that needs to be sort of carefully framed yes, as well. That's true. But I think what you get at is like the, where the texts are kind of ending. And I was actually so funny you said that because I was thinking about these Geniza documents that will say like a roomy bathroom or whatever. And you're like, that's not about production at that point necessarily. That's probably about like it looked like a Byzantine or Celtic, whatever Turkic out thing, right? And so that's about an identity through dress that may or may not be in those kind of documentary sources. Yeah. Right? So it's a real challenge, like, and, and I think that's where the Geniza documents are so fascinating, but also like we keep hitting that, that yes, limit yeah. somehow, right? Yeah. So poetry, romance, yeah, po yes, other epics. genres, yeah, <laughs> like yeah, yeah, other genres. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think we have our work cut out for us. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> Is that a joke? <laughs> no, that one was not. That one's completely subconscious. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Joel, for um, convening a wonderful panel. So we're going to have to close formally the conference. Um, thank you all uh, to the audience for putting up with our ridiculous technology difficulties. Um, we This has been recorded, and it will be on our YouTube um, channel next week. Um, I, I want to thank they can see you right now, actually. They can. Yeah, it's for us to get the camera turned around here. <laughs> they can hear me, though, right? Yeah. yeah, that's fine. They don't have to see me. They can see you. Um, I can be a puppet uh, in this in this orchestra. Anyway, um, I want to thank, uh, again, all of you for coming here and for indulging us and for we've convened an extraordinary group of people and the conversations have been so rich. I myself have learned so much. I want to thank Joel and Atia and Mika again for um, for convening us. Uh, um, I'd want to thank the GW Museum and the Textile Museum again for co-sponsoring this um, for us. And I uh, want to conclude by thanking Christian again, because he has put up with so much today. <laughs> so maybe just a round of applause for Christian. Thank you. 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 Thank you.